Hello, everyone. It's Doug Woodward once again, and it's time for another episode of The Hot Seat. I am so pleased and excited today to have a returning guest, uh, Lambert Doc, uh, Lambert um, Dolphin. I wanted to say Dr. Lambert Dolphin. He's not actually a doctor, although his uh, experience is probably worth about three PhDs. So, uh, and, and, and he got interrupted in his PhD effort. <laughs> So, uh, and so he actually has real practical experience that's probably more important. So, uh, but anyway, today we're going to talk about the Temple Mount and uh, Lambert is really one of the pioneers of exploring the possible locations of the temple on the Temple Mount. And uh, so we're going to, we're going to kind of drop into that and uh, talk about that and uh, get a little into the technology, talk a little bit about the relevance for evangelicals, why we should care, because uh, sometimes there's probably more evangelicals thinking we should care more than we really should, and there's some that wonder why we care at all. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So uh, anyway, so let me reintroduce everyone to uh, Lambert, and, um, and let me uh, I wanna turn us on here to the gallery view here for a moment and uh to uh, introduce him there he is and uh, i have come to uh know lambert well over just the last few weeks and uh am so pleased to get to know him uh and he has just an amazing wealth of information that not only that he has in his head but he has on uh, some websites that people could go to and he's really a, um, a kind of a, an undiscovered treasure in a certain sense because so much of what he did was kind of news i'd say back in the 1990s if i'm not mistaken and uh, he had a uh, ministry with chuck missler uh they did a number of of uh, conferences in israel in the 1990s and which which really kind of sprung out of the work that he had done uh in israel and uh so let me begin though by asking him to talk a little bit about sri which is a controversial place and he can tell us why it's controversial and uh, we'll kind of begin with that so lambert welcome back hey thanks so much doug i certainly enjoyed our last interview and uh, how thorough you are in uh, uh, probing the, the guest <laughs> but it was it was great fun and i talked at that time a little bit about how i came to know jesus christ at the age of 30 ripe old age after psychoanalysis and Eastern religion and all the blind alleys in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my career at SRI International, used to be Stanford Research Institute, was uh, loads of fun and very exciting, a little bit unconventional. Uh, SRI was set up by Stanford University uh, after all the Vietnam War protests. Uh, so we we're a nonprofit corporation. And uh, my particular lab specialized in, in remote sensing and, and space radars and Star Wars and all that stuff. That all died away. And so uh, my colleagues and I were forced to rethink what we might do with our technology. And we decided we'd try to invent ground penetrating radar, which had, was brand new then, radar that would you'd look into the earth with. And so we spent a lot of time and trouble checking out the radar. It doesn't work well in California. There's too much moisture in the soils. And we, we looked all over California to find a place where we could prove that the radar really works. And that led to us going to Egypt a series of four times, three times. Yeah, this is in the 1970s, just for context. This was 74, 76, 78. Mm -hmm. and discovering firsthand that the pyramids are very wet and, and have a high clay content and are not radar transparent. And we came home with tail between our legs and uh, <laughs> regrouped and went back uh, with other technologies. And so that's, uh, it's very exciting because the ground penetrating radar is now a very sophisticated technology and several commercial companies and uh, very useful if you understand where where it's going to work and where it's did, not going to did work. Did SRI hold patents on any of that? Go what? Did SRI hold any patents on? No, uh, we didn't. Uh, uh, we had an ARPA project for a while to look for tunnels in Korea, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, and we've got together other contractors and kind of coordinated their efforts, but uh, the, the patents are held by commercial companies that, that make sophisticated products. And we're, we're doing research, uh, uh, thrown together stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, to prove that technology works, Yes, yes. And, and, and then you were getting ready to sort of say you, you guys shifted away from a defense contractor uh, to begin to explore some, in some cases, some exotic things. Uh, yeah, what, like tra it, treasure hunting. And yes, yes. <laughs> and, and of course, you mentioned remote sensing, and I need to clarify for viewers or have you clarify the difference between remote sensing and remote viewing. <laughs> remote viewing is where you get a bunch of psychics together in a room and they close their eyes and meditate and spy on a, a lab in Russia mm -hmm. and write down their, their uh, intuitive insights and they, somebody checks them all out and then uh, the government puts that in its intelligence information. And it's and confusing a bit. It might be helpful, but it might be, it, be even wrong. if it's only marginally helpful, it's still Right. Better than nothing. I was trying to say it, it's a bit confusing because SRI was sort of pioneers in both. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, who were physicists, and they invited a guy named Yuri Geller in uh, in the early 1970s, about the same time you were cranking up remote sensing in Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. <laughs> and it's perfectly good science because you, you, you stay consistent, you follow the rules, you, you're uh, no one man's opinion counts for the total mm -hmm. and you, your results can be published and critiqued. So right. it's in the open literature. So you're not going out in some far mystical left field, which there, which exists, of course. Right. Yeah. There've been a number of books written. Jim Mars wrote a good book about uh, remote viewing. I have written about it fairly extensively in a couple of my books and uh, it's essentially became uh, sort of a, a weapon of war in its own right, in that it was uh, high intelligence sneaking behind enemy lines psychically, and and uh, basically the, one of the the things that was probably most interesting was the fact that some of the U.S. Army remote viewers actually discovered that Russia really was building a submarine that was very much like the submarine in the Hunt for Red October, and, and so and it was like we're we're prowling around and see this double hulled uh, ship here in this giant uh you know construction area and so uh, lo and behold it actually does work for intelligence i think it has a uh success ratio of something almost 80 percent. so it's you know it's a, it can be it can prove to be quite useful in conventional science uh one data point isn't sufficient you've got to get a whole bunch of data and correlate it and you throw out all the outliers that might in fact be gold mm -hmm. and so uh, but the but intuitive insights are where the greatest inventions have come from down through history. Somebody gets a flash of inspiration and tries it out and it works and everybody is delighted. Right, right. Well, so take us uh, quickly into Egypt and kind of what you learned in Egypt. And then uh, and then we'll jump over to how you got invited to come uh, to where the true holy ground is in Jerusalem. I love the Egyptian people and I had an incredible time visiting there and uh, exploring the pyramids in the Valley of the Kings and uh, with the full approval of the Department of Antiquities and, and teaming up with colleagues of Egyptians and uh, writing a couple of scientific reports. They're on my website, if anybody wants to dig into them and getting a little bit into the far out stuff. Are there hidden rooms under the Sphinx? Right. Which we talked about on our last program, uh, and uh, in fact, I need to put you in touch with a gentleman that um, he's called the dark journalist, a guy named Daniel List has a very big following. Um, and he he um, he's a great guy, but he certainly is more interested in the uh, well, I'll call it the occultic. Uh, he thinks of himself as a white hat, and not a black hat. And anybody is. But, uh, you know, he's still talking about the the, uh, you know, the, the chamber uh or the hall of hall of records under the right paw of the sphinx i think i'm going to put him in contact with you and just sort of say you know you really need to have a contact with a guy that was first over there uh yeah. doing all this stuff and uh it might change your idea because he 
can talk about Edgar Casey, his son, et cetera, because uh, that was who your client was, was his son. I, I'd be delighted. Yeah, I'll do it. Uh, he should uh, he should update himself on that. He deals with a lot of this esoteric stuff, but I think that he he does appreciate uh, intelligent people, and uh, and he has really interesting people on the show. So I'll see if I can get you on that. So okay. we'll see how that works out. So uh, well, all right. So uh, tell us a little bit about more about the technologies that you that you learned uh, to use uh, at Egypt or in Egypt. And then uh, how that led to uh, the, the letter or the call to go, come to the Temple Mount. Uh, the ground penetrating radar has to use very short pulses because we're not looking hundreds of miles into space, we're looking feet. So we use nanosecond pulses. And in order to penetrate uh, most media, the frequency needs to be down below a few hundred megahertz, down in the range of FM signals or lower. And of course, if you use long wavelengths to probe, you don't get any resolution. Mm -hmm. And so you also, the, the, the linchpin is whether or not the ground is, uh, will, will allow the propagation because uh, it's resistive. Mm -hmm. So the uh, radar technology got to be quite sophisticated. In fact, we did airborne flights over Indonesia to map through the jungle cover for the government of Indonesia. And I remember flying the Alaska pipeline with a radar on a helicopter mm -hmm. to look at the permafrost in the ground where the second pipeline was going to go in. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of valid technology. Another technology that's good is sound waves in the ground, seismic signals in the ground. Uh, you can't just put a loudspeaker and a microphone on the ground. You've got to have a good coupling. You've got to have a good... Tight transmitting net. transducer we use submarine transducers and you got to have a good sensitive microphone and they've got to be in contact with the rock yes and the frequencies are audio frequencies but on the other hand uh the sound waves work very well in the valley of the kings and in other places in egypt to sound the whole pyramid however you get a reflection back at every interface every every joint Mm -hmm. So you get this flurry of records becomes hard to sort it out. Right. Uh, magnetometry can be useful and resistivity. Resistivity, you put a bunch of electrodes in the ground and then you you probe them two by two in, in an array and you get a, a conductivity map underneath the, the array. Mm -hmm. And the spacing of the array is important. And uh, we, this could be automated. It's automated now. So uh, you did satellite. Uh, but the Sphinx, you sort of drilled holes. We you know, drilled that, holes. And, 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 uh, and did you use that particular technology to try to assess whether there were sort of hidden chambers uh, under the Sphinx? Uh, I forget. We, we put some kind of a probe down in the drill holes. Okay. We found water down. A, and, uh, but uh, yes, I think we put a, a cross borehole seismic sounder down the holes so mm -hmm. you can send a seismic wave from one borehole to another. And if there's any chamber in between, you'll get a signal. Okay. So, uh, but there weren't any known chambers that showed up on our probes. Yeah. The antiquities department is riding herd over us and telling us that please don't drill any more holes. Mm -hmm. And when we had finished, we had to plug the holes up with concrete so they would never be seen. Well, the Egyptians are very sensitive about anyone damaging their monuments. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, your whole point about these types of technologies, which you talk about in terms of uh, how these technologies can be used by archaeologists and so forth, is is that it's non-destructive. You know, this is you don't have to go in uh, as the uh, you know we're famously seeing people you know going down six inches at a time with toothbrushes and you know, but basically unearthing things. And it's, it's really it, that it sounds wonderful, but it's actually destructive. And, Very destructive because you end up with with uh, everything off at a museum and all the rubble piled up in a junk pile. Yeah. So you've destroyed what, what was there before you started. Kind of that the may be the only way you can deal with a tell, for example. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so so that really, um, I guess that's kind of the, the segue into, you know, how the technology could be useful at the Temple Mount because that's an even more sensitive uh, area of ground, isn't it? <laughs> Very much so, yes. 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, you got to tell us about you got how the invitation came about and that led you into some really interesting friendships. I'm sitting in my office in Menlo Park, California, and a letter comes in airmail from Jerusalem from a man named Stanley Goldfoot as a, a, a leader in the plan to throw the British out of uh, Israel and from South <laughs> Africa and a kind of a absolutely delightful gentleman. He said, well, I read in the paper here about your radar work in Egypt, and I think you ought to come and visit Jerusalem because we got plenty of archaeological sites over here. Mm -hmm. And I, that intrigued me. And as a follower of Jesus, I was very interested in Israel, mm -hmm. Egypt also, but I had not been to, to Israel at all. So I began to figure, try to scheme how to get over there. My boss mm -hmm. said, well, take a, take a week and go over there uh, on the lab's uh, dollar mm -hmm. and uh, tell us what you find. So I did just that. Mm -hmm. Stanley met me at the airport introduced me to all kinds of key players, uh, Gershon Solomon of the Temple Faithful, a number of antiquities experts, Gabriel Barquet. Uh, uh, now, was this when you met, was it Don Stewart and Chuck Smith and Chuck Smith? Uh, well, then I, yeah. So after I came home and I was glow, glowing with enthusiasm, mm -hmm. uh, then I met Don Stewart from Calvary Chapel. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was all excited about this. So he and I began to scheme how we might put a trip together. And uh, he was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. So he put me in touch with Chuck Smith. Chuck Missler was at that time teaching the Bible at Calvary Chapel. So the, the two Chucks had me down for dinner at Balboa Bay Club. And Don Stewart was there. And my boss came down with me and my pastor, Ray Stedman. And we had a uh, dinner party. I would love to have been at that dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was scary because here I am with these giants. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With the two chucks, and I'm I'm looking for money. So yeah, I, that's why you you weren't there to. Carl Galvan was with me, and I think they they saw that my pitch was coming. And so, how much money do you need? And I think I said, well, fifty thousand would be really cool. Yeah. And I guess they both they they said, well, I'll, each said I'll put in half of that. So. Mm -hmm. So I ended up with 50K. Well, 50K is nothing mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're a professional with an overhead, with a, a, a expenses, yes. with shipping and receiving and all that. But my boss back home said, yeah, go do it. Okay. So we got a small project on the books. Mm -hmm. And I went over there first time. I had met Stanley Goldfoot uh, in 82, and now it's 83. So I finally get a project put together with, I think, seven of us. Mm. And uh, uh, a plan to spend a month over there about. And all of our equipment going into foot lockers and going as excess baggage. <laughs> you, you, so you came loaded for bear, as they say. <laughs> So, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm in awe of the people I met over there, and I didn't know whether the radar would work or not, so, but the, as quick as we could, I found a place where I could look through some pavement into the limestones of Israel, and lo and behold, 100 feet is no problem compared mm -hmm. to two, two or three or five feet in Egypt. Better so, limestone, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the limestones in Israel are a different quality. I think God must have planned it that way. And they're, they're, radar they're transparent. I guess low they're, they're, content. there's a natural explanation that the Temple Mount sitting at about 2,400 feet and the Giza pyramids are probably sitting at about, what, you know, 35, 40 feet above sea level or something like that. Yeah. Pretty low. So and that the, uh, yes. Egyptian limestone is very porous. Right, and the, the humid wind blows down off the Mediterranean, and so they they get the humidity is high in Cairo. It never rains there. Yeah, and there's a lot of water seeps up into the pyramids from the Nile groundwater table. Yeah, and then the clay content only makes it exasperates it. But you don't have that uh, condition on the Temple Mount. But the 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 limestone in uh, Israel is a very different high quality limestone. It's all the buildings are built uh, out of this limestone in Israel because the trees were chopped down by the Romans. 
so they don't have any wood, as you know. Yeah. Jesus was probably a stonemason, not a carpenter, that's what I think. The result of the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 AD, if memory serves. Yep. Basically destroying Jerusalem, and which is a factor here, destroying Jerusalem, creating uh, Elia Capitolina, if I remember how to pronounce it right. So, uh, but yeah, so so that created the mystery, though, didn't it? Because the the temple, we, we look at that temple mount, and we assume that that's the way it was at the time of Jesus, and nothing could be further from the truth, right? <laughs> Solomon's temple was there. We don't know exactly where it was, and uh, the, Jerusalem's been destroyed, I think, 20 times or so yeah. by foreign armies, and they all come down and tear down what's there up particularly something that's religious and important to the Jews because this general the invasions are anti-Semitic. Yeah. And so the Solomon's magnificent temple was destroyed in 586 with a loss of great loss of life and all the millions of dollars of treasure taken off to Babylon. Mm -hmm. And the Jews rebuild a small temple in 6 516. Mm -hmm. uh, and that small modest temple enlarged by Herod the Great was the temple that Jesus came into throwing out the money chambers. Yeah. Uh, All of what so Solomon there, had done had been had been wiped down by Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Titus and the Roman armies are going to be destroying Jerusalem in 70 AD. Yes. This comes in uh, right. They actually Herod ironically supposedly just completes that whole temple complex about four years before Titus tears it down. Yes. I remember right, 66, I think, is when that was all finally finished. And they had the ribbon cutting ceremony or whatever they did. <laughs> the, uh, the, the original temple that was built, uh, uh, the second temple was a very modest building, but Herod the Great came along ambitious and, and pompous. And in order to impress the Jews, he spent huge sums of money to make that modest temple second temple into a magnificent temple he was a builder uh, he was caesarea philippi of course caesar he built yeah. that whole area uh to uh, impress caesar with uh you know his work uh, in in israel i think yeah yeah so uh okay so i keep interrupting you apologies um all right so you're you're sitting here you have all this equipment loaded up in a truck you're ready to go uh start you know doing some work you found a place where you can begin to work, you think, and and then the trouble begins. Uh, this is a, one of the exciting, exciting times in my life mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we made friends with Rabbi Getz, who was then the rabbi of the rabbinical tunnel, which runs along the western wall uh, right. uh, all the way up to the north end of the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also, Stanley Goldfoot was a mover and a shaker and a wheeler and a dealer. So he got all the permissions for us and, and set us all up that, so that we could go in at midnight into the rabbinical tunnel and point our radar through the walls into the subsurface. Ideally, we'd like to put the radar on the top of the Temple Mount, which is Muslim controlled. Right. And they would never hear of anybody doing that. Mm -hmm. So we knew we had to be a little bit surreptitious. Yep. Um, so, uh, uh, so uh, my crew and I showed up at, at the appointed hour and uh, 10 p.m. at night, night, ready for a night's worth of work, as I recall from the uh, reading your document. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a, a security guard came out and asked who we were. And pretty soon a police car drove up with a flashing light, and told us we weren't allowed to go in there. And we said, well, we have permission. And they, this was argued well. Come down to police headquarters tomorrow and we'll discuss this. But for now, you guys got to go home and get some sleep. We didn't get any sleep that night. Sure. And Stanley and I went to the police headquarters the next morning. Mm -hmm. And the inspector, Sephardic Jew, was a, a very apologetic. We know who you are. We've been tracking all your movements around the country. We know that you're here illegally with permits. And we like what you're doing. But we have a problem with the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And one of the Arab guys that works for us told us that if you were to go into that tunnel and put your radar signals under their mosque, the Arabs in Jerusalem would riot. There's a lot of them there. Right. And so uh, would you mind coming back later when it's safer? He said, <laughs> that was, of course, 
we already knew about the tensions between the Muslims and the Jews and other groups. And so, right. That was, that was, was 40 really some years. A surprise. I was gonna say, that was 40 some years ago and things haven't really gotten any better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nope. That's right. So, yeah. So you, you think he tells you, you have actually, there's no permit necessary. You can go back there. And, uh, so you're now you're armed with a little bit of hope, I guess, and uh, and then what happens? My uh, my friend Nancy Del Grande from Livermore Labs, who went to Stanford with me mm. back then, uh, got permission to do overflights of the Temple Mount with thermal infrared sensing, mm. and that's a very successful technique where you put an infrared camera in the belly of your airplane and fly over the site pre dawn. And uh, she found the original blood channel and the, her work showed, for example, that the, the basic foundation under the dome of, of the rock is octagonal. In other mm -hmm. words, there was a pagan temple there before the dome was built. That was very interesting. So the, octobo, so, the octagonal or the eight-sided shape is symbolic of not the dome of the rock's foundation per se, but a prior pagan yes. people, a high place where the Ashtoreth yes. and all that were. Okay. Yeah, that's yes. fascinating, of course. And as we're going to talk about here in a moment, that's not exactly the foundation of the temple, which, oh. you know, the two of those are supposed to be very incompatible in terms of the foundation of a high place and the foundation of God's temple. If you go inside of the Dome of the Rock, uh, there is a, a big outcropping of rock, but mm -hmm. there's actually a, a way you can get down below that and it's been thoroughly explored there's just a chunk of bedrock cropping up there mm -hmm. and nothing much more so there's no evidence that there ever was a building under the dome of the rock okay and yet that that octagonal foundation is is as right underneath not perfectly underneath it's not like it's it's just kind of overlapping kind of like yeah. a Venn diagram you know oh, yeah. or overlapping uh, uh -huh. all right and so um okay now let, this may be out of sequence. I was interested when you discovered that you you know you couldn't really do what you set out to do, that you still did a lot of work around Israel. And a particular interest to me was the uh, I, I will call it Herod's Herod's Hill. <laughs> There's a special name for it which I can't remember how to pronounce. Herodium. Herodium. The Herodium. Yeah, which is Under a fascinating. Bethlehem fascinating building and, and talk a little bit about what you learned about this is another erection by Herod and uh you know maybe his uh thought maybe that's where he had himself buried if I'm not mistaken yes uh the Herodium is an artificial mountain and it's obviously an archaeological site and we went there early on and sure enough the seismic sounder works and the radar works but sure enough we our equipment worked very well at the Herodium, and we were delighted to work with Ehud Netzer, mm. one of the really good, great archaeologists of his day. He's two years younger than I am and died in 2010, but mm. a, a man of stature and competence. And part of the great delight we had in going to Israel was working with these competent, knowledgeable archaeologists who live on very small income and who pour their whole lives into their work. So High tech is welcome, but it's hard to get paid for. Right. Well, uh, after we left, not finding any radar signals that pointed to the tomb of Herod, the actual tomb was discovered in 2007 mm. and uh, empty, of course. But was it, was it there in the Herodium or was it somewhere else? It was in the Herodium about halfway up. Uh, okay. And, All right. Uh, a surprising place. Okay. Uh, Herodium was also a palace, and you don't put your tomb inside of your palace. Mm. But uh, there's also a lot of water cisterns down under the Herodium, so they had plenty of water for all their parties and okay. so on. Okay, all right. Herod was not a nice man no. <laughs> at all. He killed all the babies in Jerusalem, remember, to stop the Messiah yeah. from being born. Yes, yeah, this is the same Herod that dies, you know, some say around 4 BC and some say around 1 BC, uh, yeah. you know, and that's kind of important because of the birth of Jesus and getting that right so that when Luke says when Jesus was born, the scripture can't be broken. So we have to understand when Herod really was dead. 
That's right. Right. Okay. Right, on, Doug. right. Right. So, okay. So uh, the Herodium thing, that was pretty interesting. Um, all right. So then I guess um, talk about what you were, what you were hoping to be able to do in terms of, you know, you couldn't come, come from the top down, but you were trying to kind of go sideways and, and still get some insight. You know, I guess the question could be asked, well, what were you looking for? <laughs> well, I wanted to prove that technology was, was viable in mm -hmm. Israel. So uh, the Israel Department of Antiquities uh, teamed us up with their leading archaeologists to go to Shiloh, to go to the, to the uh, tomb of uh, Abraham in Hebron. Yes. To, uh, uh, half a dozen other sites where we did everything we could and gave them the results and showed them this is a viable technology. And uh, the they were delighted. Trip. Please, please come back. Yeah, that's a, the trip was a great success from that standpoint. It was, but then uh, going back home, where do you get uh, money to yes. do uh, legitimate scientific exploration in a in a country that everybody hates? <laughs> a small yeah. little country. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, so you go back, and I guess you you meet with uh, Don Stewart and Chuck Missler and Chuck Smith and. You have to kind of tell them what you could do and what you couldn't do. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess kind of for that point, you know, kind of what was the next sort of uh, plan or hope, I guess. Uh, Chuck Missler was very excited about taking tour groups. He had taken tour groups Israel before, but mm -hmm. now there's an added attraction because we can have a Temple Mount conference and have our, mm -hmm. our uh, tourists sit in on some meetings and get all the experts together and have them talk about their work with to educate the, the mm -hmm. tour group. And we did that quite a few times. And yeah, looks like uh, I, I think, uh, cause I just read your paper. So this is all fresh in my mind. Uh, 1992 to 1995, you had four conferences and they apparently just went swimmingly. Well, it was also, it was a too, too strenuous for the tourists. Mm. Uh, who uh, were on a tight schedule anyway, and it's extra demand on their time when they need to be resting. Yes. Uh, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, the opportunities are still there mm -hmm. and, and uh, open door to do anything if, as long as you can pay for it and as long as you can get along with everybody over there mm -hmm. uh, with all the, <laughs> the, the tensions. and uh, Right. The, the Temple Mount is off limits. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, the strict Muslim controlled by the Jordanian Waqf. Yes. That's uh, probably yeah, going to change. I can say uh, most folks that are watching this video know that the, uh, that the, the Temple Mount is actually governed by Jordan, the Jordanian. Yeah. They have this um, little institution called the Waqf. Waqf or Waqf. W A Q F, yeah. yeah. Yeah, depending on how you wish to pronounce that. You probably know how to pronounce it. I, I always know. just said Waqf. But anyway, um, and so you have to deal with them. But yeah, as I understand it, it's that situation. It's still that way. You had, you know, Sh uh, Sharon try to go up there once and created a, a massive uh, riot. And uh, but, you know, everybody's still pretty sensitive. But uh, nevertheless, despite that, the technology works. It can it could be do, could be useful in finding things like the chamber where the Ark of the Covenant might be right and the other treasures of the temple provided that the templar the knights templar didn't take them all away uh and stash them in the languedoc in france which is another story that i write about uh yeah. so um but anyway so i guess we're probably ready to segue to the different theories of the temple mount uh yeah. and so forth but before we do that let's talk about the significance of the temple you know, the, the Jews have reasons for being interested in it for one for one set of, of realities or issues. Christians have a different set of issues as to why they should be interested in it. You might talk for a couple of minutes or a few minutes about that, if you would. Yeah, the a temple building in Israel ties the whole country together. And it's the place where the Levitical priests, the official place where you meet God mm -hmm. uh, in the Holy of Holies. And the Levitical priests would be there. and uh, uh, th this unified the whole country because all the tribes of Israel had to go to uh, Jerusalem every year and, right. uh, and so on. So, uh, mm -hmm. That's old covenant. Uh, right. Buildings 
are important to the Jews and it's got to be an exact building built by specs with the right utensils and, and a Levitical priesthood and so on. Uh, evangelical Christians get a little bit skeptical because we know from the New Testament that the body of the believer is the temple of God, that yeah, God yeah. lives in people. He doesn't live in buildings or churches. He lives in people. Well, I think both images are true. Yes, Jesus lives in people. And yes, uh, the temple in Israel is important because it has to do with the redemptive history of Israel. Israel has yet to come to know their Messiah in full and be brought up to being the most important nation on the planet. Right. And there's uh, a lot to, to throw in here in terms of some, you know, side issues and so forth. But the question of, you know, the, that when Solomon dedicated the temple, uh, the fire of God came down from heaven, the glory of God fully consumed the inside of the temple. It forced the priests out of the temple um, and the people fell down and worship because, you know, that would have been a pretty fantastic thing to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all right. But um, so you these things occurred. Then uh, prior to the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar in 586, uh, Ezekiel chapter 5, I think it is, talks about the fact that the glory of God departed from the temple due to all of the um, pagan rituals that were actually being done under the temple, if memory serves. Yep. And, uh, and, you know, this is where God says, you know, that the spirit is going to basically go through Jerusalem He's going to mark everyone that is still a true believer in Yahweh. But, you know, basically they're going to have a mark, right? Just like the mark of the beast. And it's good. They're marked with a letter Tav, which it looks like an X. Yeah, or, or, or possibly a cross. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a that mark protects you. So the destroying angel will pass by you. Pass by, yeah. So, all right. And so, uh, and then the glory of God proceeds out of the Eastern Gate. The eastern gate eventually gets shut, right? And it's not to be opened again until Jesus comes at his second coming, which, of course, yeah. that figures into the temple and some of the theories about the location of the temple as well. Right. All right. So, yeah, a lot of, oh, yeah, a lot of, of history that relates to the temple. But I guess I'm going to make a statement, see if you agree. The fundamental reason why evangelicals care about the the, the temple and the rebuilding of the temple is we see it as a precursor to the return of Christ yes. at the Antichrist, according to Paul, must be in the temple and must um, desecrate the temple and set up an abomination of desolation there. And so Christians are sort of saying, well, until the temple gets rebuilt, you know, Jesus isn't coming back. Now, of course, yes. the rapture is a separate issue. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, your thoughts on that? Back before I ever went to Israel, I met a physicist from Hebrew University named Asher Kaufman. I think he wrote me because he had been studying the temple location and was pretty well convinced that the temples were built north of the Dome of the Rock. And probably the Holy of Holies was uh, right where the Muslim shrine, the Dome of the Spirits, is located. Mm -hmm. And there's enough land there that the temples could fit there. And he marked it all out. So his theory captured a lot of attention way back before we ever went there. Mm -hmm. And we were anxious to prove or disprove Asher Kaufman's work. He was a great friend of mine and yeah. a very capable man. And he, he got to be well known in Israel. Uh, and he also showed pretty clearly that the Dome of the Rock wasn't the true location for the temple. Right. So the Temple Institute had, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, always for many years thought, insisted that the location was under the Dome of the Rock. But recently, some of their drawings have moved the location down south, which is probably more realistic. Well, yeah, they, in fact, you talk about four different theories. Yes. They kind of run theories from sort of north to south, the way you present yep. them, which also I think tends, tended to be, well, the, the, the theory that, that the temple was located right on where the Dome of the Rock is, that's sort of the conventional kind of old theory. But the other theories, you have the one of Kaufman to the north, and then you have two others that are south of the temple, excuse me, of the Dome of the Rock. And those are interesting yeah. to you. Dubious well. to give, 
who I got to know very well is an architect from Tel Aviv mm -hmm. and a, not part of the antiquities department, but he worked long, hard hours uh, studying the Temple Mountain. He concluded that the temple was probably located south of the Dome of the Rock, lower down, where you get adequate water supply from the aqueducts. Mm -hmm. And probably the temple was located under the dome, under the El Kos Fountain, which is considerably lower in elevation from the Temple Mountain. And that would be out in front of El Aqsa Mosque. Mm -hmm. So, and there's uh, a group of trees, kind of a big uh, little tree garden right there, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And, and, and so it's you're basically it's saying that, that where those trees are perhaps is where the foundation of the temple might be? Yes, underneath. Underneath. So that was one of the things that, that I wanted to prove when we wanted to look through the walls of the rabbinical tunnel. We could look right in, and if there was a ruin or a rubble in there, we probably could see it along with all the other stuff. Right. But you didn't get a chance to do that. No, we didn't. And uh, subsequently, the, the Muslims uh, went in through uh, uh, Solomon, Solomon's stables at the south end and began to haul out tons and tons of debris uh, illegally, surreptitiously, and, and mm -hmm. along with it, a lot of artifacts, and they just dumped it in the creek. Yeah. And the uh, uh, whole recovery operation, the Temple Mount Sifting Project started, mm. uh, in which all that rubble is sorted through. And mm. sure enough, there are wonderful relics and bits and pieces in that rubble. I keep discovering so, things. Even this week, I think there was a discovery of, of import. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the Solomon's Stables mm -hmm. uh, was turned into a, a, quote, extension of the mosque. Mm -hmm. On the Muslim holy day which is friday thousands and thousands of arabs go and in, flee into the temple mount so it there's plenty of muslims in jerusalem and they go to the temple mount as their shrine on friday on friday on saturday the jews show up for shabbat and of course the christian church bells ring on sunday <laughs> yeah isn't that interesting we have the three days of the weekend covered <laughs> yeah, right each day is different holy day though. wow well, yeah, and so um, you know that's the course the unfortunate thing. Now the 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 fourth, so you've got you know the the Kaufman to the north of the of the uh, Dome of the Rock. Then you have the conventional view really on top of the Dome of the Rock in that space. Then you have the uh, view of how do you pronounce his name again? Tuvia Sagiv. Sagiv. Yes, and uh, his is is sort of just a little south of the Dome of the Rock. Uh -huh. uh, and then there's a, a fourth by a friend of yours that is a teacher graphic artist that has done some fabulous graphics of of her argument for where the temple is located. Oh, Norma Robertson is a marvelous woman. She's worked uh, to build her own model of the temple. And we think, I agree with her at this point, mm -hmm. we think that the temple was probably under what where El Aqsa Mosque. Mm -hmm. uh, is now to be found and okay. so this would mean that that building the next temple uh in the right place would mean getting rid of el aqsa mosque which would be more difficult than getting rid of the dome of the rock both both <laughs> have been suggested doesn't so, make it easier that's right <laughs> now i i don't think the next temple the third temple will be built in the right location i think it'll be built for political reasons probably up north probably an Asher Kaufman's location, which mm -hmm. be, everybody could go along with that. You wouldn't have to get the Muslims out of there. You could have a, mm -hmm. a, a temple for all religions. Mm -hmm. And I think the third temple will only have a brief lifetime because I think it will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And there will be a fourth temple when the Messiah comes. It's in Ezekiel, right. the, the millennial temple, which is incredibly well described in Ezekiel. Yes.
Yeah. In Jerusalem, one of the must-see places is the Temple Institute. Mm -hmm. These dear Orthodox Jews have built all of the sacred vessels, so gold and silver trumpets and bowls and offerings, but, uh, and they have them in a museum, and they also built a solid gold menorah, all intended for the Third Temple. Also in Jerusalem, the Levitical priests are in training. This has been going on for 10, 20 years now. Right. And so when the permission is given to build the third temple, it'll be put up in months mm -hmm. and turned on. And I think that is what we call the tribulation temple. Mm -hmm. I think exactly your scenario is correct. The, the false Messiah will go to that temple and desecrate it, and that'll bring down the wrath of God and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, there's... I, so many thoughts are popping in my mind because of different things I've written about and so forth. But let's let's keep going down this path, though. So we've got and we're going to spend some more time with her particular view. And and uh, I want to introduce a few uh, people to uh, uh, just a touch of her graphics in the post-production work I'll do on the uh, the video so they can get a sense of of how elaborate the work is that she's done, which is just it's really breathtaking. She's done the best she can with, I guess, uh, I don't know if it's not Photoshop, it's another tool. But it's uh, it's remarkable because it's a 3D animation. You can do a walkthrough, and uh, it's fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, way back in uh, 1995, my friends from Blue Letter Bible and I uh, yeah. put together a website called TempleMount.org. Thank where you. We documented all of this scientifically because uh, mm -hmm. we don't want to be persuaded by politics and and tradition, and we. We just right. want the ground truth facts, and we, that's all on the website. It is it is a fabulous website. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of articles, and there's a number of links that take you back into Lambert's, uh, his, his website, which is also wonderful. And uh, this is, again, this is like an undiscovered treasure that if you're interested in the Temple Mount and where it is and, and all this issues associated with the, the Temple Mount, which really is the heart of the old Jewish religion, then uh, the templemount.org is that's the place to go. No, there's just no doubt about it. So I highly recommend it. Uh, I've read quite a bit of it, but I'm, I've read about like 3%, I think, of all that's out there. So it's, uh, it's, it's great stuff. So, um, okay, so now, um, is her name Norma, is that correct? Norma Robertson. Norma, Norma Robertson, yes. Her her theory puts the the temple kind of right on the edge, the south edge of the Temple Mount. It's kind of right where uh, right right beneath that is when the of course the, the rocks tend to go highest point is at the north, lowest point is there at the south of the Temple Mount area. And that's kind of where Norma thinks the temple might have been is in that area. There's a lot of discussion about that vis-a-vis -vis the fortress of Antonio or Mark Anthony and uh, and where that was in terms of its line of sight. Uh, before we get into some more of the detail about how it's pinned down with the kind of ancient testimonies, uh, let's talk about the fifth idea, which is a big controversy right now. And it's, it's kind of like if you fell off that wall and you fell down into what is the city of David right down in there, uh, which is where I guess David had his palace and things like that. And, and the old, I guess the, the original uh, tabernacle was still there, or David had rebuilt the tabernacle, the tents, basically. And that was the precursor, of course, to the actual physical temple there on the mount. David uh, built a palace, but up by the temple, I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the ground falls off very steeply from mm -hmm. the southern wall, mm -hmm. and it's 250 feet down in elevation to the city of David, to the ruins of the city of David. Yes. A yes. lot of really great excavations have been done in the city of David uh, in the last 10 years or so, uh, uh, and uh, phenomenal, and you can visit them. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, some monumental ruins were found down there at, near the Gihon Spring, and some what looked like religious centers. Uh, and that brought the theory uh, by Ernest Martin of uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, Armstrong, uh, Herbert Armstrong's Worldwide yeah. Church of God. Exactly. And, and uh, he wrote to me and sent me his book, and I told him he had to go to Israel and meet all the experts, which he finally did. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was adamant about the temple being located way down. Well, mm -hmm. 
there's no room for a temple down there and all the associated places. And it's way too low an elevation. And so I don't think it's a very viable theory. Uh, Bob Cornuk, who, who uh, was a friend of uh, Missler's, uh, Missler's. Mm -hmm. uh, wrote up all the, the ideas to support Ernest Martin's model. Right. And uh, But Chuck Missler, when he went over and saw the place for himself before he died, was adamant that what was discovered down there were ruins from the time of Abraham's visit, mm -hmm. a thousand years before David. 4,000 years ago from now. And we know from Genesis that, that Abraham went there and met the, the, the high priest. Yeah, the king of Salem. King of Salem, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, who was both a king and a priest of right. the one true God in the Jebusite city. And, uh, uh, and Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And yes, yes. So, so it's really a, a spine chilling to, to think about the, the discovery of the place where this probably took place. No, be all well right. before David comes along and Solomon builds the first temple, a thousand right. years. Now, Ernst Martin and the, the Bob Cornukes, their, their argument is that when the Romans tore down the temple, they also sort of tore down the mountain, you know, and that they, they reduced the elevation, you know, I don't know, 100, 150 feet. <laughs> and that they claim then that the, the, the current temple mount is really uh, and the fortress of Antonio. And that, um, and that the fortress of Antonio was higher than the temple. And supposedly, um, I guess Herod or the Romans could look down into the temple area where the altar was <coughs> and see the sacrifices. And so yeah. you had the rabbis building a wall higher so they couldn't watch. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, that's that kind of is their response is that there was a removal of not just the temple, but the hill underneath the temple. Well, the, you don't have to go much below the pavement till you come to bedrock up there. Mm -hmm. uh, probably someplace up there on that bedrock is the threshing floor of Ornon, Aruna, yes. which David bought and, and dedicated and gave, after his uh, ill-advised census of the people that cost a lot of people's lives. David was humbled and he went up and bought this piece of land and it became Mount Moriah. Mm. Mount Moriah is also the traditional place where Abraham offered his son Isaac. Right. So the, 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 the Temple Mount is a level area pretty much it falls off really fast. I do think that the, the summit of Mount Moriah is higher up, up above the uh, Damascus Road, uh, uh, close to the probably like what I think is the tomb of Jesus and the uh, garden tomb. So I think and Jesus was not crucified in the temple or around the temple. He was crucified outside the gate. So that's a whole nother. Yeah, that's the, the issue of, of further north uh, at the top, you know, sort of the top of the maps, if they're based upon south at the bottom, north at the top. That go but, if, but if you visit the area and everybody I, should go there, yeah, and you walk around the area. The city of David is a very small area. It's a you can see that it's the tail end of a mountain, and mm -hmm. it's uh, it, it's mostly rubble and <laughs> a lot of fill. Uh, uh, David's palace might have been down there. There've mm -hmm. been walls discovered and restored, uh, but right. there's nothing at all like the ruins of a temple in, mm -hmm. in the city of David. Right. Well, that's a lot of Arab houses on top. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and. Yeah, it, it it if it were true, it would you know to some extent. I think the proponents like uh, Mr. Cornuke and others, you know, they they believe well since it's not really on the Temple Mount, then uh, the Jews are free to rebuild the temple there. <laughs> but the problem is that they can only build the temple, the third temple, on top of the foundation of the first and the second. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, so that's that's the challenge. Yeah, you know, the the proponents for this this fifth point of view, um, it's very controversial. Um, I because of some of the work I did at Prophecy in the News, um, Bob Cornick was one of the sort of um, addi additional resources that Prophecy in the News utilized. I barely know Bob. I 
talked to him briefly and read all of his books. You know, he probably hasn't read any of mine, but that's okay. He's just missing out, you know. Uh, <laughs> but but anyway, there's a lot of heat. He and Randall Price, who I think a lot of Randall's quite the scholar. I don't know if you Randall know of Randall or not, but he's written sort of a definitive okay. book on the temple. And, um, and so they had been on the same platform at one time and got mad at each other and Bob stormed off and so forth. So it's a, this is a controversial topic, even among evangelicals. And um, so I guess the, the real question is, and you, you do address this in one of the papers is, is why should evangelicals care beyond just the, the issue of there needs to be a temple so the antichrist can uh, abominate it <laughs> or desecrate it. So why yeah. else do you think Christians should care about the Temple Mount? Our Messiah, uh, Jesus, is actually Jewish, uh, Yeshua. And so uh, we, we really are serving a Jewish man mm -hmm. who said that he was God and came into the Jewish tradition and uh, lived in Israel and died there and was raised from the dead there. Uh, so that's the, but, but the Old Testament promises, God made a whole bunch of promises to the Jewish people starting back with Abraham, unconditional promises. The promises to Abraham are twofold. He promised uh, uh, a nation as numerous as the stars in the sky, that's us, mm -hmm. and as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashore, that's the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. So we're two peoples a, a little bit different from one another, enjoying uh, the, the same Messiah, the same Jesus who's going to bring all this to pass. Israel's a very lowly nation right now among the nations. Uh, pretty phenomenal what they do with what they've got, but right. uh, God keeps his promises, and he's going to keep all of his promises to Israel. In fact, Israel is a template. All the other nations will be measured by the standard of Israel. Mm. And Israel is the first nation to declare that there is one true God in a very polytheistic pagan world, Abraham. Mm -hmm. So the, the most wonderful days of planet Earth are up ahead as the real Messiah comes back to Israel and cleans house and puts it all back together again. Mm -hmm. um, the book of uh, Zechariah says that in the final war, two-thirds of the Jewish people will be killed, and one-third will come to the Messiah. Mm -hmm. That's actually a large fraction, considering that Jesus is not very popular anywhere these days. Mm -hmm. That's true. There's, this brings up a question or a point. Um, you know, it, it really helps when you're, when you're doing the, the reading and so forth to keep a map of Jerusalem, the Temple map, kind of uh, the mount right, right in front of you. And to recognize, okay, there's the Kidron Valley on the, if you're looking at this map, you know, in the north here and the south there, you know, the Kidron Valley is on your right, and the Valley of Hinnon is down below. The western walls over on the left, up at the top is where Antonio's fortress was. Beyond that, there's this high wall and this moat, and that's the, the north is the highest level, and probably outside of that area is where Golgotha is. Uh -huh. the garden tomb and so forth but it was from the north that the romans attacked yep. jerusalem and uh, ultimately they they regained the the fort and then they eventually from the fort they had access easily because it was lower to get into the temple area and yes. so um you know so it's important to keep all that but uh, jumping forward to the second coming of christ there's quite a debate uh about where the you know the valley of megiddo is and whether it's in the north where you know it's named the Valley of Megiddo, or whether it's really Har Magadan is the Mount of Megiddo, or uh, Michael Heiser says that it's really the immediate area right between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. That it's really, in effect, the the Kidron Valley is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Judgment, and so forth. And that kind of makes sense if Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives, where it splits and. And I believe it's Zachariah says that the Jews should rush into the the cleavage there of that valley for yeah. preservation, and then Jesus will destroy then the enemies that are there in Jerusalem. So uh, you know, the geography is kind of important, isn't it? It is because there is a real Mount Megiddo, a Harmageddon up north, uh, inland from Haifa a little bit, well to the north of Jerusalem. Right. And uh, there is also the campaign of Armageddon, mm -hmm. Har, 
Megiddo. Right. And uh, Isaiah gives a very vivid description of that campaign. When the Messiah Jesus comes back, he will come back to Edom in the south mm -hmm. and with his entourage of horses and, and saints. saints. And, 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 and probably and angels too, but I think the saints are there. I plan to have a horse. Come back and uh, he gets to Jerusalem, and, and it's noted in Jerusalem that he's got blood all over his garments. Yes. It's not the it's not Jewish blood. It's the blood of his enemies because he's come to clean house and uh, uh, slaughter from one end of Israel to other all the people that don't know him and, right. and are on the other side. And so the, there's a bloodbath that goes up 200 miles from one end of Israel to another. That's the campaign of Armageddon and it ends up in Jerusalem and as you pointed out the Temple Mount is split by a great earthquake mm -hmm. a great fountain of water breaks loose under the Temple Mount half going down to the Mediterranean half going over to renew the Dead Sea yeah and then the, the, the Lord Jesus comes with all of his saints and uh, we start the thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth mm -hmm. with his bride the church alongside of him with him. So yeah. that's all the promises of the New Testament of us ruling and reigning with Jesus are as the bride of Christ, I think, my okay. opinion. Right. Now, it, well, I was listening to the Battle Hymn of the Republic um, earlier this week, and I was listening to the words, and I, it really struck me when I, I, just what we were just saying. You know, he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. I mean, that's revelation. That's why he has blood on his garments yeah, yeah that, that wonderful song was a civil war song but i don't think she knew that she was talking about bible prophecy yeah or or they did they but they they interpreted it and not literally but figuratively right civil right. war was a terrible bloody oh yes oh yes of course they were trying to elevate the the campaign or the 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 uh you know the 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 plan or the strategy or the uh, the mission I should say of the North as being uh, you know God's mission, yes. and uh, and so that's why they probably were sort of euphemistically looking at the Book of Revelation you know as a fulfillment that this is a step towards creating a perfect world you know <laughs> that we'll get rid of slavery and we'll create a perfect world, and uh, and of course there's a lot of people today called Dominionists that still believe that aren't there. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, you know, an incredible, so this uh, really the, the, what we've just kind of been through is, is, you know, the reason why Christians ought to find this really interesting is because it's really laying out what's going to happen at the time when Christ returns. And so the Temple Mount is right at the center of this activity of, of the campaign, uh, the desecration of the temple and so forth. So it's why it's, it's not a secondary issue. It's an important issue. So yeah, the two Jerusalems, Doug, hmm? well, there's the there's the earthly Jerusalem and there's the heavenly Jerusalem called New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And these two are juxtaposed in the Bible. And eventually the heavenly Jerusalem comes down to the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, I think New Jerusalem is the place the uh, bride of christ will live for seven years during the awful tribulation period mm, mm -hmm. and, uh, that's where bride and bridegroom will enjoy the marriage supper of the lamb and, mm -hmm. and uh, enjoy healing and so on and i think that the population of new jerusalem will be maybe many billions of people from every nation we hope and so. from two thousand years of history right personal opinion <clears throat> yeah your opinion is um, is one that's of course consistent with the dispensational point of view of which I, I agree with almost all of that. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I love, I love that. And, um, you know, and so anyway, I guess we could, we could kind of begin to, uh, to wrap up. There's, there's so much that we could talk about the, the different theories. I, I, I will want to uh, show people, um, you know, some of the work that, that Norma has done, give them a glimpse of that, encourage them to go out and see it. In and this quick illustration, I have opened the water channel of the aqueduct and flooded the court. Abe in the fourth century said, if these artificially constructed water channels be opened, the water rushes in from all sides and the marble floor of the sanctuary is washed clean of the blood 
of the sacrifices in the easiest manner. The Tofesto says, How is the court cleaned? Seal the area and let the water from the aqueduct enter till it becomes clean like milk. Water also bubbled up like a spring from smaller water channels built into the bottom of the altar all the way around it, helping to quickly flood the court. There was a drain shaped like two nostrils at the southwest corner of the altar. Once the water from the aqueduct to the court is closed off, then the water is drained away. The water mixed with blood made, it, made its way um, through the blood channel and entered the sewage ditch that ran along the Teropian Valley alongside the city of David and ultimately dumped into the Kidron Valley. And to study the, the you've got a nice overview of the different four options. We didn't really talk about, you could make a comment if you'd like to, so much of the, the detective work about locating the, the, the mount or the actual foundation of the temple is reading these ancient historians like Josephus and so forth. So uh, I noticed that you, you uh, talk about that quite a bit in your paper. So <clears throat> yeah, so there's, there is a lot of information there that brings together the history. Uh, Josephus, of course, is talking from a standpoint of a witness who was witnessing the destruction of Jerusalem and talking about the location of the fort and there's different levels given in terms of the elevations and the distances and so forth so there's a lot of information there and i you know i guess the long story short is that to me it looked like the preponderance of the evidence is clear that the conventional view is wrong <clears throat> that the that the dome of the rock is not the foundation point of the location of the of the of where the temple will be placed, and uh, and to your point, the third temple may in fact be put in the wrong place. Uh, it may be a good reason for it to be destroyed. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but uh, but nevertheless, this is you know this is coming to pass really quick now, and uh, so we need to be observing this very carefully. And um, do you foresee or any discussions you have with folks? that suggests that any additional work is going to be done uh, in the immediate future to try to sort this out? The, the main uh, roadblock is the political situation, which is international. Right. And that somehow that now the government of Jordan is unstable. And if they were to go away and the Saudis took over, that might change the custody of the Temple Mount, currently in the Jordanian Muslim walk. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, the the religious Jews in Israel are uh, uh, praying for the coming of the Messiah and praying for the temple and putting dedicating their whole lives to getting the Arabs out of there mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's a politically it's a loaded place over there now uh, before the real Messiah comes there's a, a fake Messiah going to show up in history Mm -hmm. And the Jews are going to buy into him, and he's going to deceive them, which is right. And we call the Antichrist. Yes. So and that's sort of happening right now because I think the the government of Israel is pretty tentative and yeah, pretty weak, unstable, and um, the, the the voices of religious conservatives are not heard anymore, and everything's driven by international politics and money and so on. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and uh, now the, the theory I put forth, which is a theory that quite a number of, of other evangelicals, uh, you know, sort of some of my colleagues that we talk about is, is, the, is the view that the, the war of Gog and Magog uh, may be instrumental in clearing the way for uh -huh. the people to be rebuilt. And uh, that in effect, there is a major defeat of the nations that have come against Israel. This is not the at least the view of the dispensationalists is that this is not. I, I, I agree with that completely, mm -hmm. Doug. Mm -hmm. uh, Ezekiel thirty-eight and thirty-nine are very very interesting. Uh, these uh, armies from the north, Russia and uh, Afghanistan and and Turkey and right. all come invading down uh, uh, Muslim countries, right. and they're stopped 
on the hills of Israel, the whole army is destroyed. Right supernaturally and it shakes everybody up and the Jews are unscathed mm -hmm. and the size of their boundaries is probably enlarged and more Jews can move back to Israel because half the Jews in the world live in the United States now Still. they've all got to make Aliyah and come back home right and so I think that everybody in the world's going to get shaken up about what the heck is going on over there with Israel Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to galvanize all the nations in the world to wipe out the Jews once and for all. Yep. Peace treaty and all that stuff. Uh, so uh, there's a, uh, the Gog Magog war goes in the favor of Israel, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Chuck Misser was very interested. He thought there was a nuclear exchange involved. Right. And it'd, it'd be seven years to bury all the radioactive debris. I think that probably is, is in the text. The uh, Gog Magog battles is mm -hmm. not just a one, it's a whole campaign. It seems to extend from the time of the rapture, probably, or after the rapture, mm -hmm. to the time of the second advent. So it's probably, yes, uh, 38 and 39 are, are seem to take extend over seven years total. Yeah, yeah, it's they're very, it is very likely that dispensationalists, we believe that you know, that you can map sort of Daniel's 70th week and Ezekiel. Yeah. 38, 39, kind of right on top of each other. Yep. Now, um, Missler um, made this comment once, and I did some research. One of my one of my books is called The Next Great War in the Middle East. And in that book, I argued that the next great war is not the Psalm 83 war, but is the Battle of Gog and Magog. And in contradistinction to Brother Joel Richardson, who believes that the Ezekiel War and the Gog Magog War are either the same, or the Gog Magog War is exclusively at the end of the millennium, right? Which is talked about in Revelation about 21, 22. That, um, but I argue that the next great war is in fact Gog Magog, and that that is the what that is the war that sort of clears the way. The the Israelis probably even with the blessing of the Antichrist at that time are given permission to rebuild the temple. And, I agree completely with that, Doug. I, yeah. I, right with you. That seems to be the scenario that a lot of folks, and that's Chuck uh, Missler had made the comment, and Grant Jeffrey and some others said the same thing, Randall Price, Chuck Smith. I'm sort of in their same camp, which is that the rapture likely occurs right at the same time as the Gog Magog War, and it may occur even several years before the uh, Daniel's yep. 70th week actually kicks off. Yep. So, and that's kind of what I suggest. And I, of course, this is at the same time that I suggest as the rapture uh, happens, the United States uh, is basically destroyed, at least yes. the coast, west coast may be destroyed. So you want to move to the middle part of the country with me. No, you don't. You're going to just get raptured. <laughs> so. You know, uh, uh, Doug, I, I see as never before the importance of every believer walking as closely with Jesus and obeying him one day at a time in a very unstable world. Yes. And knowing the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament and steeping in the Bible and talking to God and comparing notes with other people, because it's a very turbulent uh, yes. period of history we're in right now. I think I think we're at at the end of an age. Yes, I think you're right. I think you made the made a comment in the last um, interview about the fact that COVID uh, which is, you know, perhaps what is that number, seal number three or seal number four, that the uh, the pandemic, the, the the green horse, the gray horse, um, which is very likely a pandemic, it may have, in effect, be a triggering event for uh, the final, you know, seven, seven years or nearly this final seven years. So uh, any com further comment there? We're getting a precursors mm -hmm. of those judgments in the book of Revelation that uncannily like the the real terrible judgments that haven't started yet i think right. the, that's all in the book of revelation uh which is amazing the amount of terrible destruction that's going to come down on the whole earth right uh, once once the start button goes and yes yes well, i don't want to be here no i don't either i I'm uh, looking forward to uh, being with family and friends that have uh, gone on before us. And hopefully you and I can look at each other and see, uh, you know, people that look like they're 30 something instead of, you know, 60 or 70 something, right? 
yeah. have a new body and all that. We hope yeah. that will be true. We hope that that's the plan. Yeah, so, I need uh, a new body at my age. Yeah, yeah, I, me too. I, mine's beginning to wear out for a variety of reasons. <laughs> so I'm older than I look. I always like to say that. I'm older than I look. So, uh, well, listen, um, obviously we could talk more and more and more, but, but there'll, there'll be another topic for us to uh, dig into, but I'm going to uh, see if I can get you on another program or two and talk about some of the work that you did in Egypt. Doug, I would be honored. It's a great privilege and it's loads of fun too. And I just appreciate you very much and your Thank work. You. And, Thank uh, you. As a, my brother in Christ, uh, God bless you. Thank you. Well, it goes double from from my standpoint because I uh, I have I have followed you quite a lot over the past so oh, I don't know twenty years, and uh, finally getting a chance to meet you and talk with you is just a blessing, for sure. So uh, anyway, so well, brother, thank you. Um, hopefully, I'll have this uh, published in the four or five days, and make sure you know about it when I do. And uh, for everyone out there, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion with uh, with Lambert Dolphin as much as I have. I do encourage you to uh, go find lambertdolphin.org, I believe it is. Is that correct? L Ldolphin.org. Oh, yeah, Ldolphin.org. Ldolphin.org and also templemount.org. And um, you just got to go scan it and see the amazing amount of information that is out there. And um, <clears throat> you know, it's. I answer all my email, Doug. You do. You do. And he, he's very good at answering his email. And frankly, I do as well. You might, uh, Lambert, tell them folks how they can reach you via email. Uh, Lambert at ldolphin.org. Lambert dot L dolphin. Lambert at ldolphin.org. Okay, Lambert at ldolphin.org. Okay, great. And I want to say, say that Doug's books are really excellent. I'm delighted that they're in my library uh, mm -hmm. with his uh, gracious uh, help. So uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I only have about another uh, 15 or 16 to send you eventually. So, <laughs> so you have to stay on a fairly tight reading program here. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, very good, brother. And um, anyway, oh, you can reach me at Doug at faith hyphen happens dot com. Doug at faith hyphen happens dot com. And likewise, my website is faith hyphen happens dot com. So you can also look me up by Doomsday Doug. <laughs> so you, you'll find me. That's my, my, my marketing moniker, <laughs> Doomsday Doug. Uh, so anyway, so blessings to everyone. Lambert, look forward to talking to you again very soon. And um, as, as we used to say, here, there, or in the air. <laughs> right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.